Crises, unlike anything else, trigger experimentation all along the line. We try to deal with the change the pandemic exacted as good as we could. Six years ago, a keen statement had been published in the ETH Zurich pamphlet issue on field instruments of design. Field work is not optional, it is mandatory. Four years later, at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, during preparations for field work on Europe's largest refugee camp, the same academic did not anticipate the corona pandemic, but he may have had a foreboding. In a paper titled Convergent Digitality for Design Action in Obstructed Landscapes, presented at the DLA 2020 conference, he wrote, academic maneuverability increasingly becomes affected by willfully reduced mobility. Global flight shame will presumably have impacts on the travel policies of universities and territorial contention will make traveling and movement for fieldwork purposes not easier. He mused, one day the educator may have to travel alone in order to deliver real-world information to staff and students. Anyway, the product should be genuine and unspoiled. That was before COVID-19. For the Moria project on Lesbos Island in Greece, we still could bring our students to the field. That was in February 2020. But our plan to come back to Lesbos Island for the subsequent studio did formidably fail. Traveling had been banned. The co-authors of the paper at hand, Christine Lee Peterson and Molly Andrews, took part in the affected studio. Their tutor was that person who constantly uttered that fieldwork would not be optional, but mandatory. <laughs> Our fieldwork was originally scheduled exactly for that period in which the Moria camp was set on fire. Wow, that would have become memorable fieldwork. During the travel ban, we decided to do three essential things. We kept hold of our studio topic, Habitats for Displaced Humans. Not being allowed to travel anyway, we chose places related to the Moria project and subject of migration and refugees that are, would we be physical travelers, entirely out of reach for us. War affected Syria. The war in Syria has made 12 to 14 million people refugees, which is around half of the Syrian population. Crisis-stricken Lebanon. Lebanon remains the country hosting the largest number of refugees per capita in the world. Gaza. Gaza is almost inaccessible and cut off from the outside world. Of the over 2 million people living in Gaza, more than 1 million are UN-registered refugees. The third of our essential decisions was to travel, though not physically. We were forced to become exactly what all DLA speakers had always banked the drum for, digital landscape architects. Both our navigator and the geographer had the same first and last name, Google. As researchers of an affluent, technologically advanced country, we unleashed our digital labor force. Our walking robots, developed by Boston Dynamics, set out on foot towards the Middle East. Sometimes they are a bit wobbly on their feet, but all in all, they perform pretty great. Our stars were the robotic birds, the bionic bats, and the butterflies developed by the German Festo company. Here you see them arriving on the beach of the Gaza Strip. Such complex technology can only be controlled with the help of facilities like our brand new coordination center near the North Pole. The concept behind it, a hand-in-hand -hand collaboration between a team field on site and a team Houston in a control room on campus, made for globally operating landscape architects. In 1970, Mission Control in Houston saved the lives of the Apollo 13 crew by remote action, directed by legendary Gene Kranz. In our coordination center in Norway, it looked like that in reality. No robotics, no bionics, to be sure. The most engineered tools were our laptops. 
Gene Kranz at NASA operated with machines that were gorgeous. But what NASA did not have was today's connectedness to the world. Considering the technological advancement between the 1960s and today, the fantasia about walking robots in the snow, flying tools in bird shape, and remote-controlled camera butterflies is far from being off one's trolley. Such tools could become off-the-shelf products relatively soon. Remote design action could become an impactful approach in the future for places that are kept from the world public with might and main. It is virtually impossible for us to take students to Gaza, but should that mean that this place will remain a white spot on the radar of landscape architects forever? We don't think so. One of our students decided to focus the coastline of Gaza. She stuck to our studio rule of traveling as authentically as possible by seeing the real scenery en route through Google Street View, by flying on real bookable flights and monitoring them through apps like Flight Radar 24, and by reserving real accommodation through Airbnb, etc. Slowing down the pace of the digital travel to everyday speed mimicked authenticity and reflected that traveling is continuous, unlike the hectic jumps that Google Earth suggests. Ingeborg borrowed a horse from a Palestinian friend for surveying the waterfront of Gaza. Gaza is a broken-hearted place, but its most significant landscape feature, the coastline, is amazing. Though patrolled and constricted by Israeli armed forces, it is the only border of Gaza that kind of looks and feels open. Would anyone in the future intend to invest into the open space quality of overpopulated Gaza, then the coastal area would be a suitable place. Our student delivered a visual survey of the entire waterfront of Gaza, which has not been done often yet, and which reveals how tremendous the development potential of Gaza would be beyond the infinite loop of rocket fire from Gaza by Hamas and the knee-jerk air raids by the opposite party. In the paper, Christine and Molly sagaciously explain, by addressing their own works on Lebanon, the remote field work as well as the studio work and results that did not much differ from works before the travel ban as to format, manifestation or volume. Remote wayfaring constitutes a high risk of failure, but the food for thought produced by the students was well-grounded and serious. It was genuine all-digital landscape analysis and subsequent design work, involving everything conceivable from Google Earth to the CIA factbook, from popular Snapchat to Instagram, from respectable university libraries to YouTube and good old Facebook the whole nine yards of profaneness. There was nearly no use of sophisticated armamentarium. It was kind of not needed for the act of remote wayfaring, this time at least. This may be utterly disappointing insight, but at the same time a very encouraging finding. Did we need to use any different digital instruments than we would use during a physical fieldwork mission? The answer is no to a large extent. There were no outstanding differences. We would have used the same canon of catch-all digital applications sitting in our hotel room or breakfast room before leaving for fieldwork. The standard applications for orientation and navigation. The standard online social media and networking services that almost everyone uses every day in any case plus all other services and portals that can be retrieved online. The great secondary digital information pool provides insights in places and situations that we are not able to visit or experience. The World Wide Web is full of uncalled for litter. What we have to do is finding the serious ingredients. We would not be able to visit Gaza during an airstrike and take footage of such hellscape. The people who live there do exactly that and post the material on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, etc. Designers and researchers must, to an increasing degree, include this secondary information the web provides. 
Virtual fieldwork should become a self-evident complementary instrument in the course of any landscape design studio beyond one's own nose. However, the limitation and paltriness of such remote action are elusive. They remind of the Apollo 13 mission where they have had a problem. In order to save the life of the Apollo 13 astronauts after an explosion on board, they had to tinker in the control center in Houston an adapter for the Apollo air filter system to make a square cartridge compatible with a round one. In space, the crew had to copy the do-it-yourself construction remotely in order to survive. All the two teams on the ground and in space could use was what had been at hand on board the Apollo 13 capsule and lander. It was not much, incredibly limited and paltry. It was Ed Smiley who finally cobbled together the famous emergency solution. He used duct tape, a plastic bag, the cardboard cover from a flight plan and a hose from one of the spacesuits. Like that, he saved three men and a most advanced high-tech agency from tragedy. As the Apollo 13 drama, the pandemic will become history. Remote wayfaring and virtual fieldwork, however, may only begin right now. In landscape architecture, a digital breakthrough materializes only now, not in the form of a revolution, but quietly and silently as an inevitable result of a worldwide crisis and in the most self-evident and unsophisticated garb. Thank you for your attention.